Uh, it is um, my great pleasure to introduce our final guest speaker, Emi Rudersdorf, who is the Assistant Director for Content at the DPLA, Digital Public Library of America. Um, we had a wonderful introduction to Emi's presentation yesterday when Perry Collins of the National Endowment for Humanities presented the DPLA as a success story in the realm of digital humanities. Emi, you were not able to join us yesterday, but I think you have to uh, listen to this presentation. Um, as you probably know, the PLA represents sort of the next generation of digital, libra digital libraries, large-scale digital libraries, by addressing the limitations of resource discovery in the digital library environment, employing a new approach to aggregating and disseminating cultural heritage resources. DPLA aggregates content from smaller individual um, digital collections, regional hubs, and content providers, and provides not only a portal for global searching and retrieval, but also new ways of transforming uh, metadata through linked data and a platform for interacting with resources and developing new apps and, and services. Uh, DPO is relatively new, although it took several <laughs> years for, of preparation and planning. Um, the site was launched in April 2013, and currently DPLA, DPLA provides access to over 10,000 digital objects from libraries, archives, and museums. Amy Rudersdorf has been a DPLA um, member since its um, launch. She's responsible for multi multiple areas, uh, including developing and uh, of and uh, being responsible for versioning of metadata application profiles, creating and coordinating all metadata crosswalks, quality co control, and data integration of you know, for a million of records from content and service hub uh, partners. She also provides uh, education and outreach to organizations interested in DPLA uh, partnerships and manages ongoing relationships and communication with uh, hub partners and all the activities related to community outreach, digital curation, and metadata uh, research, including linked data, uh, normalization, and taxonomy improvements. She also has been very influential in uh, developing and implementing um, uh, student uh, digital curation program that engages library and information science students in uh, curating digital exhibits for the DPLA and a number of uh, library and information science programs have participated um, in this uh, initiative. Prior to, to joining uh, the DPLA, Amy served as the director of the Digital Information Management Program at the State Library of North Carolina. She was a Library of Congress National Digi Digital Stewardship Alliance uh, coordinating committee member and an active voice in the digital preservation community. She also teaches in this area, especially in digital preservation um, on the graduate level in um, uh, library and information science programs at San Jose and North Carolina Central University. Um, she also worked with digital collections uh, for a number of years at North Carolina State University and also at the University of Wisconsin, um, Milwaukee. So she brings really a wealth of uh, experience in the digital library um, uh, uh, development. Please welcome Amy. Amy, I'm turning the mic to you. Hi, Amy. Uh, you will need to press uh, the talk button underneath the audio and video. Sorry. OK. I've got it now. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, I am glad to be here and to talk to you today about history and culture at scale. Um, uh, I think. The introduction uh, gave you a pretty good sense of what I do at DPLA, um, and I'm glad to talk a little bit about it today. Uh, so my plan is to talk a little bit about the intersection between information and technology with arts and humanities. I think that DPLA's three component facets, facets if you will, its portal, platform, and the advocacy um, for the public option wherever possible, play directly into that. The content in DPLA is served up in new and innovative ways. 
and uh, that opens it up to new audiences through technology and new standards for access. So the Digital Public Library of America brings together the riches of America's libraries, archives, and museums and makes them freely available to the world. It's a free online library that provides access to millions, currently over 10 million um, books, photographs, maps, audiovisual materials, and more from libraries, archives, museums, historical societies, and other types of institutions across the U.S. Uh, I like to talk about DPLA as four, four separate concepts in one name. So um, it's digital, it's public, it's a library, and it's a, uh, of America. Um, we are an online resource. Uh, we are public in the sense of ac freely accessible and open. Uh, we are a library in the sense that we make uh, available content, but it is from lots of different types of institutions. And the content that you find in DPLA is um, of America, but it is not just about America. So let's talk a little bit about D DPLA and how it works. Uh, this is the portal homepage. This is a, the screenshot's a little old because, as I mentioned, we're over 10 million items now. Um, there are lots of ways to interact with the interface. And I'm going to talk about those. And these are, I think, unique ways that um, we are beginning to work with um, content in the arts and the humanities. So the first thing I want to point out is you know, that this material comes from a variety of, of, of institutions on a variety of topics of interest to researchers, educators, students of all ages and interests. One of our collection goals is to get as diverse a representation of institutions as possible. And diversity can mean all kinds of things. It creates an environment in which content that may be hidden, and I put that in finger quotes, at one institution is discoverable next to better known, again, sort of uh, can put those in, in finger quotes as well, institutions or content. So one of my favorite examples of, um, of this is, is a search on Sinclair Lewis, who was the first American author to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. So that's what you're seeing here is a search result from um, that search. You might expect to find some of his public domain texts in HathiTrust or the Internet Archive and pictures at the National Portrait Gallery or New York Public Library. And indeed, all of those are available through DPLA. But most interesting to me is a series of letters between him and his mistress, Marcella Powers, um, detailing his travels and his work over, over nearly a decade. They're held by St. Cloud State University in Minnesota. Um, and I think that's the important piece here, is that we might expect to find these resources in other places, but these important and valuable resources are found everywhere, including um, a smaller school that you may not think of right away when you think of Sinclair Lewis. And all of these materials together, uh, perhaps somewhat unexpectedly, create a portrait of Lewis that one collection alone could not. There's also lunch boxes and pictures of kittens. So there's a little something for everyone. So DPLA is partnerships. Um, so the, we said, I mentioned 10 million records, and the big question is, where do those records come from? There's no special magic. It's just lots and lots of collaboration. Um, and we've talked about collaboration over the years. The DPLA is an example of where that group work that we did in graduate school really plays out. Uh, partnerships are diverse. And in this context, I'm talking about hubs and their contributors, the institutions that make the content available to DPLA. So we have two different partner types at this point, that we have service hubs and content hubs. Content hubs are large aggregations of data. Um, so that you'll see big sets of data from GPO and the National Archives, 
uh, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, from all different types of, of institutions, the J. Paul Getty Trust, so we have the Getty Research Institute's collections, the Smithsonian Institution. But we also have partners um, called Service Hubs, and they are aggregations of statewide or uh, regional partnerships, collaborations of 150 or more partners on a local level who are aggregating content and making it available to DPLA, as well as providing services to smaller institutions of all varieties to make their data available, but also to develop capacity at the local level. So here's what the network looks like. Service hubs and content hubs working together with DPLA to make this content, this metadata available. Here's what the network looks like. The states in red are our partners. Uh, dark blue are those who are in development. And light blue is where we've yet to build um, hubs. So 15 content hubs, 11 service hubs, 1,600 contributors. And here's what that contributor, um, how those contributors break down. You can see, as you might expect, that uh, there are public libraries and university libraries widely represented in DPLA. But just as importantly, you'll see museums, historical societies, archives, historic properties, uh, government agencies, state and national parks, K-12 schools, and more. We are truly a diversity of, of institutions coming together for a single purpose. And part of our collection plan is to systematically put in place what will be needed to ensure that there's an on-ramp to DPLA for every collection in the United States. We call this completing the map, or making sure that we have a DPLA service hub available to every library, archive, museum, and cultural heritage site that wishes to get their materials online, and described in such a way as to be broadly discoverable. So we're creating a national network that can share knowledge, build out technologies that are useful to many, and to grow existing collaborations to build capacity at institutions of all types and sizes. So first off, I want to talk a little bit about the portal. And when I say portal, I mean the front end. And this is part of what DPLA does. We provide record level access um, to content that is held by contributors across the US. So when I say record level access. What I mean is that our partners provide us with metadata, and we point back to them so that researchers and users of all types can find the, the content that they hold. So um, we are a, a clearinghouse of sorts of, um, with, with the metadata that's, that's uh, shared with us. We call uh, the DPLA portal the one-stop shop. Um, and what this means is that you're going to be able to access all these collections. Um, interrelatedly th through different search interfaces. So here again is the home page. You can see there are lots of ways to interact with the data on the site, from exhibitions and maps to a simple search to applications built out by our hacker and developer friends. So part of our collection goals is working with partners to ensure that their data is as interoperable as possible. And I think this is, this is a key component to what we do, is making data uh, interoperable to enhan enhancing and enriching it so that it can be used in new ways. So one of the things we do is to provide a map-based interface that allows users to identify the places associated with a given item. But the way that that happens is that we, um, when data is given to us that doesn't already have coordinates, for example, provided, but only strings representing places, we actually enrich the data that we get. And this, is, this happens um, in most cases. We do enrichment at, the central, at a central point. We add coordinates automatically to nearly any term that is provided to us in the place value um, so that they can appear on this map. Those coordinates then can be used by others who want to manipulate the data. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We do the same thing with dates. So the DPLA timeline similarly uses time information, year, month, day, to chart records related to search over time. So here's an example where I've searched for Philadelphia and, um, and looked at the timeline on the year 1776 to get these results. Um, the user can capture a particular period of time that will display in the blue section at the bottom. 
So you can see there's a timeline uh, bar at the, in gray at the top, and you can slide across time. But we enrich the data as well to ensure that there's a begin and end date for every record that we're able to interpret. Um, and when, when that's the case, that record appears on the timeline. Here's a search for urban planning on our bookshelf. It represents digitized books available through the portal from providers such as the University of California, New York Public Library, and, and others provided through HathiTrust Internet Archive and directly from our service hubs. So this is just another way to interact with data that we've, um, we've all worked with over, over the years, but it's a new way of, of visualizing um, bibliographic information. So the shelf is shown with, um, as a vertical stack so that the titles and authors are more easy, easily readable on their spines. So here, the darker um, books are the most relevant, and as you scroll down, the books get lighter and lighter as relevancy changes. Um, the orange book in the middle, I've clicked on that, and that's pulled up information about the book on the top right, and then related images based on the subject terms that are provided for this for this record. So again, we're visualizing, we're interacting with data in new ways. Um, it's kind of old data in, uh, with new interactions. Another way that we're interacting with the data is through our exhibitions. Um, the exhibitions on the site were curated by our partners and through pilot projects with uh, groups of MLIS students across the US. And Christina mentioned this um, in the introduction. The, the four, the five exhibitions at the very beginning, um, at the very top, were all curated by students in graduate programs. And these were managed by their um, professors over the course of a semester or a um, uh, individual project. So this is another way that we're able to contextualize the data in DPLA um, which at, at scale, at 10 million records, becomes hard. But um, it also in, enables us to involve students um, and researchers to build uh, like materials and, and um, to contextualize those materials in a way that we might um, not have done um, before. And, and at scale, when we're working with contributors across the United States, it gives us access to um, participants, so participants in this program specifically, uh, that we might not have access to if we were doing this on a smaller scale. The exhibitions offer some opportunity to create juxtapositions between items within the Digital Public Library of America and then use them in narratives to give them useful context. So that's the portal. I want to talk about the platform. And I think this is where DPLA is truly innovative. Um, we are not just a digital collection, but a way to interact with uh, data um, at scale. So um, the platform is one of the most important parts of our technical infrastructure. It provides us, as well as our more technically inclined users, with the ability to search and retrieve metadata ingested from our hubs and their contributors through a free service called an API. That's basically a machine language that enables data sharing. So it enables us to share our data, our data in the R here being our, our 1,600 partners data, not just as a single record at a time as you would in the portal, but suddenly as collections of data or as collections as data. So the collections themselves become the, the um, data that can be manipulated and analyzed. So if we think of our collections of records as collections as data, the easy to use and extremely helpful tools in the portal begin to fall short of fulfilling the needs of many scholars, including digital humanities scholars, um, and the, what they require to do their research. They and others like them want to access these collections as data and to move them into environments that they work in using their own tools to manipulate it. It's got to be what they need, how they need it machine actionable, open, and available data. So machine actionable means simply that um, the data needs to be structured in, structured in such a way that uh, computers can, can manipulate it or analyze it, use it in ways that they, um, 
that makes sense to them, which, you know, for computers is actually um, quite limited. Um, we also make the data, so we make the data available through the API so that others can interact with it. We also make the data available via bulk download. So you could actually go to our website right now and download the entire data set for DPLA, um, but I wouldn't recommend it because 10 million records is a lot of data and it can make you, make your machine very sad um, if you don't have a super powerful machine. So we're able to do this, we're able to make this data available because um, as part of the contribution process, we require all of our partners to dedicate their metadata to the public domain with a CC0 determination. And this is really important. As we start to think about our collections as data, as we start to try to share them with digital humanists, we need to, we need to ensure that our data is as open as possible because if there are restrictions on it, people can't do what they need to do with it. So the CC0 determination enables creators and owners of copyright protected content to waive all copyright interests um, in their works and thereby place them as completely as possible in the public domain so that others may freely build upon, enhance, and reuse the works for any purpose without restriction under copyright. So because we require this of our contributors, we can do cool things like all of the apps you're seeing on the screen now. So these were all developed by um, hackers and others that are interested in DPLA but are not employed by DPLA. So all of this was done by our community of supporters. So it's, between, it's because of the CC0 designation and the API that this, this is possible. So I want to point out a few of these applications um, to you because I think they're really indicative of the way that users are thinking about the data we're creating now. So the first one is um, Serendipomatic, which is in the middle on the right. And it um, takes it takes our API along with several other APIs from national digital platforms and makes them available through a single search. If you haven't ever used Serendipomatic, uh, you should try it right now while I'm talking. Um, it's a single search for over 40 million records um, from all over the world. It includes New Zealand, Canada, Australia, and Europe. Likewise is this interface, this is Europeana, which is um, uh, the, the digital collaborative in Europe. And here you can see along the top of the, there's a horizontal bar and um, that indicates all of the sources for records that appear in their World War I interface. And you'll see highlighted the American sources and those all come from DPLA. So again, because the metadata is freely accessible, we can start to manipulate it and, and allow for interactions we might not have um, ever thought of. This is just one more um, app uh, and, and like others on the app page, this interacts with the data in DPLA, again, not on an individual record basis, but as a collection of data. Um, it's, it's analyzing the metadata uh, itself. It's, it's doing um, manipulations of the metadata and identifying issues within the metadata to tell you um, more about the work we're doing as opposed to the records we're, we're exposing. So, so this is a particularly interesting um, application. And then finally, this one is kind of just for fun, but I think it's, it's another way of um, interacting with data that wouldn't have been possible even a few years ago. And here is an application called Browse Color by Chad Nelson. And basically, you input a color and it outputs resources in DPLA that are actually that color. So again, another way of thinking about the data that we are creating and ultimately sharing on this national scale. So um, this is how we share out the data. Uh, it's a very complex schematic. I'll try to make it simple 
and this is where um, I'm being slightly sarcastic and, and trying to be funny, but it's hard to do that when you're talking to a computer screen. So um, the metadata comes in from our partners. You'll remember that uh, we have service hubs and content hubs. Um, the data comes in. We turn it into something called JSON-LD, which is a, the API language. Um, the LD stands for linked data, which is um, how we are create uh, is a way of um, is a machine actionable language. Um, so that data, that feed uh, is sent out to um, those are hackers and, and uh, developers in the top left. We actually run our portal using that same API feed and then we send it out to the world for endless possibilities. Because, and I think this is a notion that's so very true and one that we as a community need to get sort of uh, more on board with, but it's that we need to enable and provide access to the data and services that we're creating uh, because the best thing uh, that will be done with our data will likely be thought of by someone else. So this all plays out um, in the next section I want to talk about, and that is DPLA as an advocate for, this, for a strong public option. For most of American history, the ability to access materials for free through public libraries has been a central part of our culture. The DPLA works with others to ensure that this critical, open, intellectual landscape remains vibrant and broad in the face of increasingly restrictive digital options. The DPLA seeks to multiply openly accessible materials to strengthen the public option that libraries represent in their communities. DPLA believes in being a voice for best practices in galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And we want our partners to join us through advocacy and implementation. Together, we want to promote maximal openness and reuse. So this, this relates to the data that, that our partners are creating and sharing, but it relates to the objects that that data describes as well. And I think we need to consider the delivery expectations that our users have. And this is a really important component in any technology that we're um, implementing at our institutions. Making money off of works does not mean that you can't also share objects broadly. So this is just an example um, of a public domain work that is shared broadly. So this is clearly public domain, 1610. This is the Rijksmuseum um, and, uh, in Amsterdam. And they make their their public domain content openly available to download and get creative. And this is something that we as a community need to think about more in a technological uh, landscape where our users are expecting access to the content that we are um, digitizing or making available through our, our portals, our websites, um, and maybe even our APIs. So uh, we need to we need to work together to make this happen um, and really begin to open up our content as much as we can so that we can do innovative things like um, what History Pin does where we start to um, provide historical context in a very contemporary in, uh, interface. So here you can see images that have been plotted on a, um, a Google, Google view of, of, a, of a street, so Google Street Map. Again, we can't do this kind of um, interesting work if we aren't opening up our content as maximally as possible. Um, obviously, copyright is an important concept um, and applies to a lot of work, but when it, when it doesn't apply, when our material is public domain or um, we can opt for a more open um, approach by using things like Creative Commons, then we as a community should, should do our best to, to make that happen. And why do I um, talk about this? Well, uh, because we found that we aren't doing a super job of this right now. Um, we found that in the collection, actually, when it was about 8 million records, there were 78,000 different rights statements in DPLA. Um, 
that number is obviously much higher now that we've increased by 2 million records. We're probably talking about 90,000 or so different rights statements. Um, and we need to, as a community, more clearly communicate um, how our users can use material when they can use it. And if they can't use it, to cl clearly communicate that as well, but to ensure that we're providing access to material as openly as we can when we can. So I'll just give you a quick example of um, where we're not doing the best job we could. So there's legal precedent that tells us that digital, uh, that copy, digital images can't be copyrighted. Or, um, and I'm not a lawyer, so do not quote me on this, but uh, there is uh, precedent for this fact. So by stating that this digital image um, is, it has its own copyright, we are locking down what is cl a clearly public domain image. Um, and I say clearly because I've done the research uh, and it took me just a short time to find out that Shatuck died in 1931. Um, and if you are familiar with copyright law, you know that death plus 70 um, gets us to 2001, which means that this image is safely out of copyright. So we need to rethink how we're approaching um, access to our materials. We're, um, as an aggregator of metadata from all these different institutions, DPLA is in a unique position to help our partners recognize and manage data quality issues. So in 2014, DPLA was awarded a Night News Challenge grant to support the development of human-friendly and machine-actionable, there's that phrase again, rights, licensing, and public domain statements. With our partners at Europeana and legal scholars from across the U.S., um, including Greg Cram, Dave Hansen, and Melissa Levine. We are working to create a clear set of statements, an actual controlled vocabulary that can be used by cultural heritage organizations to better communicate the status of the materials in their collections and to open up the possibilities for appropriate sharing of our rich content um, to the users who want and need them. So what we'll be able to do is what Europeana can do, and that is to actually facet by copyright. You can do this on Flickr and some other sites, but uh, to be able to do this in our own library sites is really pretty exciting um, and I think innovative and uh, the, the place where we need to be. Um, so we can only do this if we do it together. Um, there are so many things we can accomplish if we work together, and so doing this, uh, doing, undertaking these challenges at scale is really the way that we're going to push our community forward. And I hope you will join us as we do. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amy, for very informative and really exciting um, presentation of different dimensions of the PLA. So we don't only think about in terms of platform and, and access uh, to resources. We have a number of, of um, comments and questions, and one is related to copyright, and I think you answered most of it, but can you see the questions in the chat room? I can. I'm going to try to scroll up until I see. Uh, just give me one second while I read okay. the question. So um, as far as copyright goes, the individual items have their own status, the digital objects themselves. And so um, it is up to the contributing institutions to assign the status or, or to identify the, the status and communicate it. Um, the, the metadata is a different situation. And, and where we run into confusion is that these uh, digital object copyright status statements are sometimes confusing, um, they can be misleading, and in some cases they're just not right. Um, and so this is where we want to act as advocates um, and help educate folks um, on this topic. I hope that answers the question. Um, the next question is, The next one is on hubs. Can you see yep. it? Okay. 
Um, so I think that this is something we're definitely considering, um, and, and there are, we are still very much developing our network, and so you will see um, that we are actively pursuing ways to ensure that any institution that wants to participate can. And um, in some cases, this isn't happening as quickly as um, we might like, but it is, it is happening. And so um, if you are from an institution where you would, um, uh, if you would like to participate, but the hub in your state isn't um, able to help you right now, let us know so that we can send me an email so we can make sure that um, we've, we've got you on the radar and, and can help you um, with that. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? I don't see any chat room. So, um, Jeremy, perhaps we can move into the kind of wrap up and the general Q and A. And I'm not sure, Amy, whether you can stay for the Q and A. Sure. Okay. Thank you.